On some nights, when the sky over a powerful thunderstorm is clear, you might see elves, gnomes, trolls, or blue jets. Blue jets sound kind of random here, right? But we're not actually talking about fairy tales. These are all just different types of lightning flashes that are mostly visible very high above raging thunderstorm clouds. Let's take red sprites. Those are flashes of light that appear above thunderstorms that come in clusters. They are rare because they're only caused by a specific type of lightning called positive cloud-to-ground strikes. So a positive charge is transferred from a thundercloud to the ground during a lightning strike. These types of lightning make up only 10% of all lightning strikes. For more than half a century, many believed these flashes were just urban legends. People did see them from time to time, but the flashes were so brief that even if you had been lucky enough to catch them, you wouldn't have had time to call someone to witness this phenomenon with you. Even when respectable scientists or pilots would talk about them, the scientific community would mostly ignore them. In 1989, something strange happened. The researchers from the University of Minnesota actually managed to catch sprites on film. And that's how it started. People across the world began sharing videos and photos of red sprites. Red sprites can start as 328-foot balls made of ionized air. These balls shoot down from heights of about 50 miles at 10% of the speed of light. And researchers have been studying not only the lightning that plunges down from ranging clouds, but these colorful flashes that go towards space too. So, electricity stretches up to the electrically charged ionosphere, but at the same time, it crushes down towards the ground. Red sprites come in different shapes, like these big, cool jellyfish sprites that sometimes have areas that measure up to 30 square miles. You may see carrot sprites or column sprites. They're similar, it's just that carrots also have long tendrils. The lower parts of tendrils are often blue, while the higher ones are red. On August 22, 2022, we were able to take some stunning photos of bread right streaks in the sky above the Atacama Desert in Chile. They were surrounded by another bigger glow of greenish color. It's something we call air glow and you can only see it this well when there's no light pollution. It's basically when we use too much artificial light, and among other things, it doesn't allow us to observe stars and other objects we might otherwise see in the sky. And this air glow happens because of atoms of nitrogen and oxygen in our atmosphere. Sunlight knocks away their electrons during daytime, then, they slowly recombine with their electrons, which is a process that causes them to glow. How can you see a red sprite? First, you need to find a large thunderstorm. They're more common during summer and spring, for example, in June. Of course, sprites can appear at any time if there are powerful enough storms with lightning at ground level. The skies need to be clear and very dark, ideally without bright moonlight and the storm should be around 100 to 200 miles away. That way, clouds won't block the sky and you'll have better visibility. In the perfect scenario, the storm will be moving along a distant horizon, so you'll be able to see everything above the cloud tops. You can track a storm with weather radar. Your eyes need some time to adapt to the darkness around you. Give them some time, about 20 to 30 minutes. Keep your eyes above the clouds and try not to look at the clouds directly. Ignore lightning flashes. A sprite will pop maybe once for every 200 lightning strikes. Don't expect to really capture it on camera, it's not easy. But the view itself will likely be worth the wait. This and similar flashy events are something we call TLEs, which stands for Transient Luminous Events. Blue jets are also worth mentioning. These are dim blue lights that stream up like a very fast puff of smoke above powerful hailstorms. They're also very rare, and in most cases, you'll only be able to see them from an airplane. And now we get to those fairy tale creatures. 
elves. When we talk about lightning flashes, are brief disks of dim light you can see about 60 miles high in the atmosphere. It's just an abbreviation. Their full name is Emissions of Light and Very Low Frequency Perturbations Due to Electromagnetic Pulse Sources. Yeah, I suggest we stick to elves. Moving to trolls. Those are red spots that pop close to cloud tops after the flash of a very powerful red sprite. Gnomes are the smallest and fastest flashes. We're talking about tiny white spikes of light that flash from the top of a big anvil of thunderclouds. The anvil is that elongated cloud you see at the top of a raging storm. It spreads downwind together with upper level winds, and gnomes last for only a microsecond. And check this out. Ball lightning is in the shape of fiery orbs that can be as big as a golf ball or can grow up to a very large beach ball. They can be yellow, red, white, orange, green, or purple. And they can stay alive for a couple of seconds, even minutes sometimes. Over the centuries, many people have been talking about how they saw ball lightning, sometimes even floating into their homes. But such events are really unpredictable and happen very rarely. Scientists have managed to recreate ball lightning in the lab, or at least something very similar to it. They have realized that ball lightning probably shows up after a lightning bolt strikes the ground. Mineral grains in the soil then vaporize. Here's something spectacular, volcanic lightning. This one is born in the plumes of a wild volcanic eruption. Like the rest of thunderstorms, volcanic lightning forms when static electricity builds up in Earth's atmosphere. And then it gets released in the shape of a lightning bolt. Scientists don't understand the whole mechanism here, but they think it's related to charging. For example, ice charging is what causes thunderstorms to form. It plays a part in producing lightning during volcanic eruptions too. This happens when the air heated in an eruption rises into the sky and meets cold air. The water from the eruption turns into ice particles, and when these particles bump into each other, some electrons get knocked off. The ice particles that now have more positive charges move higher into the sky and gather together. Or it may be frictional charging, another thing that leads to volcanic lightning. The same as ice charging happens when tiny particles of ice collide. Here we have ash and pieces of rock colliding and creating charged ions. There's dark lightning too. Over 10 years ago, researchers discovered that thunderstorms could generate brief but very strong bursts of gamma rays, which is the form of light with the highest energy. They are so bright that they can blind sensors on satellites, even when they're hundreds of miles away. They can also create antimatter. Antimatter is a type of matter made of particles with opposite charges compared to the particles in normal matter. Imagine having two boxes full of blocks. Some blocks are red and some are blue. When these pairs touch each other, they disappear or annihilate and turn into energy. That's what happens when particles of matter and antimatter meet. And these flashes could be the result of dark lightning because it gives off light that's not really visible. Regular lightning involves slow electrons. In dark lightning, electrons are high energy. They crash into air molecules and, by doing that, produce gamma rays. Not many survival stories can rival the miracle that happened to Marine Lieutenant Colonel William Henry Rankin in 1959. See for yourself. One bad day, this man nearly drowned, falling from the sky. Um, are you saying that it sounds too paradoxical to be true? Then take a seat. I'll tell you a story. It was July 26, 1959, when Rankin was piloting his F-8 Crusader, a single-engine supersonic aircraft, along the North Carolina coast. It was a high-altitude flight, and Rankin, together with his wingman, Navy Lieutenant Herbert Nolan, were flying at the height of more than 47,000 feet. Their jets, nicknamed Candy Stripers because of their unusual orange and silver-gray coloring, were moving through the air smoothly and lightning fast. The only thing that could cause some trouble was a storm that was raging far beneath the plains. But now, it didn't present any threat. 
However, the pilots were supposed to pass through this storm on their way to the Marine Air Base in Beaufort, South Carolina. Things took a turn for the worse when the aircraft was approximately nine miles and mere minutes away from the military base. Suddenly, Rankin's engine quit and the fire warning light switched on. Unable to restart the engine that had lost all power, the man knew he didn't have many options. That's why, desperately trying to keep his plane from gaining speed and going into a complete nosedive, Rankin radioed his partner. Engine failure? I have to eject. It was a terrifying decision since the altitude was too extreme and the Marine didn't have a pressure suit. The only thing that could help him survive was an oxygen mask with a limited oxygen supply. In any case, the pilot didn't have a choice. Without hesitation, he pulled the overhead handle that triggered the ejection, and in no time, he was in the air, and his plane disappeared in the clouds below. Now Rankin was in a free fall at a height of 40,000 feet, with a temperature of minus 65 degrees F. Usually, sports skydivers make their jumps from a height of 3,500 to 10,000 feet. Only highly experienced experts jump from altitudes higher than 15,000 feet. Even then, it can lead to serious complications if they don't have all the necessary equipment, including a pressure suit, which, as you remember, Rankin didn't have. That means that when the man found himself in the air at such an unprecedented height, he experienced severe decompression. It felt as if his stomach had increased to twice its size, and his nose seemed like it was about to explode. His eyes, ears, and mouth started to bleed. For several blood-curdling moments, the Marine was sure that the decompression would finish him right away. Little did he know, he had a much more severe trial ahead. Rankin continued falling, and all he could feel besides all-encompassing fear was the shocking cold. His wrists and ankles were burning as if someone had put ice directly on his skin. He'd lost one of his gloves while leaving the plane, and his left hand felt completely numb, and to make matters even worse, He was still in free fall. Of course, the pilot had a parachute, but it was supposed to deploy automatically at an altitude of 10,000 feet, and even if Rankin had decided to open it, he simply wouldn't have been able to do this. That's why, in a matter of seconds and at a dizzying speed, the man hit the very storm he'd been piloting his plane over just minutes before. And that's when another calamity happened. Rankin had been falling through the black clouds with almost no visibility for about five minutes, surrounded by lightning, rain, hail, and violent winds, when something went wrong with the barometer that was supposed to deploy his parachute automatically. Fooled by the violent weather raging around the Marine, it triggered prematurely, and the man got stuck in the very middle of a thunderstorm. But it wasn't just any old thunderstorm. Nope. The unlucky 39-year-old fighter pilot plunged straight into a cumulonimbus cloud. These clouds, which often look like huge puffy mushrooms, are incredibly dense and tend to appear in areas where the atmosphere is extremely unstable. Also, such clouds are vertical and the peaks of the most monstrous ones can reach the height of 70,000 feet. The taller the cumulonimbus cloud is, the more unstable and violent it is inside. That was the circumstance Rankin ended up in after his parachute opened too early. Conversely, Even if his parachute had deployed at the supposed altitude of 10,000 feet, the man would still have been sucked back up into the cloud with the updraft. In any case, the pilot didn't have time to dwell on this. His body was tossed about as if he was nothing more than a rag doll. He would hit the fabric of his parachute, fall back down and repeat this cycle again. The tossing was so bad that even the experienced fighter pilot felt seasick. Lightning snapped and crackled around Rankin, and even though he didn't hear the thunder per se, he could feel it vibrating through his body. The hailstones were so big that at some moments Rankin worried they would tear his parachute. The worst happened when the pilot was falling through the rain. For several terrifying moments, the man was sure that he would drown. He was trying to take a breath, but only breathed in mouthfuls of water. If he'd stayed in that region of the storm for any longer, drowning while falling through the air would have become a frighteningly real outcome. He tried to hold his breath, but it was a very dangerous thing to do while falling at breakneck speed. Meanwhile, Rankin was also blown up and down, sometimes as much as 5,000 feet at a time. It seemed to him like he'd been falling for ages, with blasts of compressed air hitting him the whole time. Fortunately, not only good things, but bad ones too, tend to come to an end. When Rankin finally reached the bottom of the Cumulonimbus Tower, he'd been inside for more than 40 agonizing minutes. 
The pilot was shocked to discover that he was relatively unscathed. The lightning hadn't grazed him, his parachute was in one piece, and he hadn't drowned in the rainwater. The only thing he had to worry about now was a safe landing. At first, Rankin was going down toward a clearing, but his bad luck continued, because at the last moment, a powerful gust of wind threw him into a tree. The parachute got tangled in the branches, and the pilot hit his head on the trunk. Luckily, he was still wearing his helmet and didn't lose consciousness. After freeing himself and staggering to his feet, the pilot limped through the forest until he found a country road. But hitching a ride turned out to be a tough task. Imagine a man standing on the side of the road, covered in blood and dressed in a soaked, ripped up flight suit. No wonder there weren't many volunteers to give him a lift. But eventually, someone picked him up and drove to a payphone where Rankin managed to call for an ambulance. There, he found out what a lucky man he really was. He had countless bruises and welts scattered all over his body. He suffered from bad decompression effects, and he had frostbite. But other than that, the ordeal didn't leave any long-term damage. Rankin spent several weeks in the hospital and made a complete recovery. Later, he wrote the book, The Man Who Rode the Thunder, where he described his experience. If you know other incredible survival stories, let me know down in the comments. If you learned something new today, then give this video a like and share it with a friend. But hey, don't go bail out on me just yet. We have over 2,000 cool videos for you to check out. All you have to do is pick the left or right video, click on it, and enjoy. Stay on the bright side of life. Hi there. Have you ever wondered why birds tend to fly in circles? It's because of thermals. Now, a thermal is like a big bubble of warm air that rises up from the ground. Have you ever flown a kite on a windy day and watched it go up and down? Well, imagine if the wind was warm instead of cold, and instead of a kite, you were a bird or a glider. So yeah, that warm wind would be a thermal. Thermals occur when the sun heats up the earth, and the air close to the ground gets warm and starts to rise. This creates a column of rising air that birds and gliders can ride on to go up into the sky. Just like how you use the wind to fly a kite, birds can use thermals to soar without flapping their wings too much. They can circle inside the thermal and go higher and higher without using up too much energy. Those that especially tend to use this flying in circles mode are large raptors, such as hawks, vultures, and eagles. When these birds circle in the sky, it looks like they're just hanging there. But nope, it's all about thermals again. It helps them because as they go higher without getting tired, they can look for food more easily or watch out for predators from a good position in the sky. Thermals are important for some other animals that fly too, like insects. You may see lots of birds flying in circles together. Sticking together helps them save even more energy. Some birds, like geese and ducks, tend to fly in a V formation to save their strength. What's interesting is that all the birds in the flock take turns leading the V. As they fly, the birds at the front get tired, so they fall back, and another bird takes their place as the leader. This way, every bird gets a chance to rest and save energy. Thermals can also create powerful storms, like thunderstorms. And sometimes, when you see birds flying in circles or a V-shape, it's because they sense a storm is coming. This happens because bad weather comes hand-in-hand hand with low pressure. Low pressure systems are areas in the atmosphere where the air pressure is lower than the surrounding areas. When the pressure drops, it can cause the air to move and create wind. If there's enough moisture in the air, the low pressure can even cause thunderstorms, heavy rains, or even hurricanes. Migratory birds are often those who use their keen sense of hearing and vision to detect changes in weather conditions. When a storm is approaching, there can be changes in air pressure, wind speed, and temperature, which can affect their behavior. Some other animals have interesting types of behavior when the bad weather is coming, too. Cows and other livestock may huddle together in a group for warmth and protection during a storm. Also, cows are known to lie down in a field before a storm as a way to ease this discomfort. Or at least that may be something you've heard. So, what have you heard about this herd? Well, the belief is that cows predict the weather and lie down because they can feel a drop in air pressure that comes with an approaching storm. But science hasn't confirmed it yet, since there's not enough evidence to support this idea. Cows do like to lie down from time to time, but they do it for a variety of reasons. 
such as to rest or ruminate. So when you see one lying down, you can't be sure it's because bad weather is coming. Different studies show different results. One found out cows didn't show any significant changes in behavior before the rain, while another study found that cows stood up more often as the rain was coming. Apparently, no one has actually asked the cows about this, but the cows aren't talking, which is why this point is moot. Amphibians, such as frogs and toads, can give us information about natural phenomena. When you hear frogs croaking louder and longer than usual, it might indicate that a storm is approaching. Frogs are sensitive to changes in humidity and air pressure, and they tend to become more active and vocal just before a storm. And when it comes to toads, research says they might even predict earthquakes. This is because before an earthquake, there are changes in the chemistry of the ponds where toads live. The shifts in the ground causes these changes, which in turn causes the toads to flee their homes. Scientists believe we should study these patterns to predict earthquakes more accurately. Meanwhile, dogs can sense storms and thunder too. They feel changes in the air pressure in the atmosphere. Plus, they have a way better sense of hearing and smell than humans. When a storm is approaching, you can spot certain things in their behavior. For instance, they may become more restless or clingy. They may pant excessively or pace back and forth, and they may try to hide in a safe place. This is because dogs can feel the static electricity that builds up in the air before a storm, and they may become anxious or frightened by the loud noises and bright flashes of lightning. There were stories that dogs can predict earthquakes, too. But there's no firm evidence of that. But who cares? Dogs are our heroes even without that. Now, honeybees can sense changes in pressure and humidity levels as well. So they use this information to predict when a storm is coming. These are social insects that live in large groups in hives or colonies. That's why predicting weather is so important for them. They need to protect their hives and forage for food before the storm hits. So for bees, bad weather may come like a real vacation they've wanted for so long. Just some chilling and eating all the food they've gathered before. Just like me, in the sense. Spiders have superpowers when it comes to weather, too. Well, they can't exactly predict the weather, but their behavior can give us a clue about temperature outside. When it's going to get colder, spiders might seek shelter indoors. So, if you see many spiders in your home, it could be a sign that colder weather is on the way. You may have heard snakes can predict earthquakes. The legend where this belief started actually dates back to 373 BCE, when snakes and other creatures are said to have left the area before a major earthquake in Greece. Cool story, but there's little firm evidence to support the theory. Scientists do acknowledge that snakes and other animals can sense earthquakes a few seconds before people do, because they can feel the initial wave better. But it's still not clear if they can detect it days in advance. How about sheep and their sixth sense? It allows them to predict rain or snow. They huddle together tightly before a storm, which could be a way to keep warm or protect themselves from the weather. But this theory needs to be yet appropriately tested and proven. Bad. You will hear wolves howling during big storms as well. Many people think wolves do it when a full moon is outside. But some experts believe the change in air pressure that comes with a big storm may cause discomfort in sensitive canine ears. And this is what makes them howl. But again, it's hard to tell precisely because wolves howl for many reasons. They do it to signal danger, attract a mate, and communicate with their pack. There's also no evidence the full moon fascinates them so much that they feel the urge to howl when they see it. But it's good for the movies, though. Sharks have ears sensitive to changes in air and water pressure that usually occur during hurricanes and tropical storms. Some experts believe they can detect these and quickly dive into deeper waters to stay safe. Studies show sharks behave like this many times before storms. Again, no one's sure 100% about this, but like many other animals, they do have a special ability to detect changes in their environment and use it to survive and thrive over time. Ah, a purple sunset. You must have seen one of those at least once in your life. 
Normally, it's nothing ominous and has to do with the way light travels. The light that the sun produces is white. When it goes through a prism, you see light waves of different colors, from red and orange to blue, green, and indigo. Light normally travels in a straight line if there's no obstacle in its way. The shorter light waves, including blues and purples, are scattered easier when they meet with those obstacles, like molecules and aerosols in the atmosphere. Because the sun is low on the horizon at sunset and sunrise, its light has to pass through more molecules that scatter the violet and blue light. The colors that your eyes pick up, then, are yellow, orange, and red. But, with the right conditions, you can see the gorgeous purple sky. Sometimes purple sky appears for much scarier reasons. It can be caused by hurricanes, wildfires, or dust storms. The concentration of vapor in the air increases, and the light scatters more than usual. Dust, a setting sun, and low cloud cover all contribute to this natural show, too. The sky turns orange and red at dusk if there's still enough light. Then it gives off pink hues, which mix up with a dark blue sky above. Now, do you remember what happens when you mix pink and blue? You get the color purple. Not every hurricane makes the sky turn purple, and trying to predict if it's going to happen is like trying to forecast a rainbow. Still, people reported several major hurricanes made the skies turn purple. Now, green skies might look just as spectacular as purple ones, but they actually also scream danger. They're usually there to tell you a thunderstorm, hailstorm, or a tornado is somewhere nearby. The unique color is a result of yellow sun rays getting mixed with the blue light coming from storm clouds. So you're enjoying a nice day by the ocean with a fresh breeze in your hair, when suddenly you notice the water starts retreating from the beach at a huge speed. This is a sign for you to start running as fast and far away from the beach as you can. This most likely means that a tsunami is on the way. A quick reaction maximizes your chances of survival. Now, if you notice the sea level is rising, but it doesn't seem too extreme, it could be another sign of an approaching tsunami. It happens in 40% of cases, and the incoming water is the first tsunami wave. The next one, way larger and more dangerous, usually follows in about 10 minutes. Another thing about tsunamis is that they like to arrive with some loud sounds. People describe them as thunder, the sound of a locomotive, a helicopter, or just a loud boom. Do you see a channel of choppy water on the beach? It's in your best interest to stay away from the water there might be a rip current under the surface that can be extremely dangerous. Sometimes waves hit the shore in a weird way, which forms these rip currents. You might see a strange break in the waves, or an area with a different color than the rest of the water. Random bits of seaweed going in all directions is another rip current warning sign. If you happen to find yourself caught in a rip current, try to stay afloat, but don't try to go against the current you'll only waste precious energy. Scream for help and try to float your way along the beach. Once you break out of the current, swim diagonally to the shore. The next time you spot conically shaped clouds in the sky, remember it's a good time to start looking for some shelter. If it just stays like that, a severe storm is on the way. But if a cloud of that shape starts spinning around, it means it's about to transform into a tornado. If you have bees nearby, they can save you from big trouble one day. These hard-working little guys get more active than usual when they feel like a storm is on the way. They speed up to collect more nectar before it hits them, and once they're done with it, they'll always come back to the hive 10 to 15 minutes before heavy rain, even when there are no obvious signs of it coming. Their secret is super-sensitive hairs on the back that can pick up electrostatic buildups from storm clouds. For centuries, people have noticed that animals act weirdly a couple of days before big seismic events. Dogs can't start barking, cows halt their milk, and toads, rats, and snakes leave their homes. It looks like animals can feel smaller initial shock waves that humans don't even notice. Scientists have tried to find some legit explanation for it and run endless tests and experiments. But so far, they're still on their way to explaining this mystery. Can you smell ozone in the air? When a thunderstorm is on the way, it's the most distinct and pungent smell you can pick up. 
an electrical charge of lightning sets it free from higher altitudes. The other, more pleasant smell of rain is petrichor. Rainwater wakes up molecules on plants, trees, concrete, and asphalt. The aroma spreads all over the place. You can even feel that smell in your own mouth. All those positive ions in the air that a lightning bolt sets free gets mixed with ozone and your saliva. And that's how you get that bitter, metallic taste. When lightning is about to strike, you might hear bizarre crackling, buzzing, or vibrating sounds coming from metal objects nearby. Your palms may begin to sweat, and then you can feel your hair stand on end. That's a clear call for action, and that action is to run for your life. Positive charges are going through your body, trying to reach toward the negatively charged part of the storm. Trust me, you don't want these charges to meet. If you see no shelter that you can reach fast, try to make yourself smaller than the objects around you. Drop down your umbrella and stay away from wire fences, metal pipes, rails, and other metallic objects. And don't lie flat on the ground, it's likely wet, which means it's a great conductor of electricity. If you suddenly notice crevices in the asphalt next to your house, it could be a sinkhole warning sign. Inspect your house on the inside. Does that door begin to jam? Or maybe there's a gap where the walls meet the ceiling. Uneven kitchen cabinets and drawers, slanted floors, stairs that begin to slope, water leaking after every rain, and displaced moldings are all signs that a sinkhole is about to open. To find out if it's definitely a sinkhole and how dangerous it is, you gotta consult with an engineering company. If you find a sinkhole that's already there, you gotta stay away from the sinkhole area. Fence or rope it off to make it less dangerous for others. You'll need professional help to fix it. Some volcanoes scream when they're about to erupt. Small earthquakes, which often happen before, produce a hum. It's mostly non-audible to human ears, but sometimes it reaches a frequency that lets you hear it as a strange rumbling or hissing sound coming from the ground. This noise is known as a harmonic tremor. With some volcanoes, it's the sound of magma bubbles vibrating when they're going through crevices in the crust of the Earth. But it's not always like this. If scientists manage to understand what exactly causes these volcanic screams, they could create a limited early warning system for volcanic eruptions. If you're out in the wild, pay attention to the water in creeks, streams, and rivers. If its level is quickly falling, even if it's raining, this might be a sign of a nearing landslide. And if you hear a faint rumbling noise or unusual sounds, like boulders knocking together, it could mean debris is on its way to you. It's a sign to head to safety immediately, like right now. Earthquake lights are some of the most mysterious natural phenomena. They can show up before, during, or after an earthquake. They're usually white or blue and last for a short time, but sometimes they can last up to 10 minutes. It's hard to study them because they can happen at different distances from an earthquake center. We know that they only happen during powerful earthquakes that have a Richter scale rating of 5 or higher. Scientists believe they may be caused by the release of ionized oxygen that occurs when certain rocks break apart. This next weird phenomenon is not spontaneous, but it doesn't make it any less impressive. You'll need to head over to La Macarena, Colombia to see it. It's called the Liquid Rainbow or the River of Five Colors. Here you can see the river change colors from red, yellow, green, and purple depending on the light and water conditions. This amazing sight is caused by a very talented aquatic plant. It attaches itself to the rocks in the river and gives the water a reddish color. The water is also very clear with very few particles floating in it, making the red pigments show even clearer. Should you ever reach this amazing destination, you'll also meet diverse fauna hanging around the lake. Red macaws can be seen at this location as well as howler monkeys. Every fall and spring, a magnificent natural phenomenon takes place in the Wadden Sea region in Northern Europe. Approximately 1.5 million starlings flock at the same spot to rest in the tall grass for the night. However, before the night settles in, 
the starlings may be surrounded by hungry birds of prey. This creates a mesmerizing dance as the starlings form intricate patterns to escape from the birds of prey. This spectacle is referred to as the black sun and involves thousands of millions of birds flying in formation. The reason for their synchronized flight is that it makes it more challenging for predators to single out and capture some of the starlings. Volcanic sounds, also called volcanic acoustics, can happen before an eruption. They come from magma getting pressurized in cracks and pipes, bubbling explosions, and hot water systems near the surface of the volcano. As the magma rises, gas builds up and cracks the surface open. The gas-rich magma creates a sound like a pipe organ, which is known as a volcanic tremor. The sound changes over time, resembling a natural concert. A volcanic tremor is a sign that an eruption is coming. So it's best to seek shelter if you hear anything unusual near a volcanic site. One of the most surreal phenomena to experience on Earth is near sand dunes. Should you ever be at the top of a sand dune, you may be lucky enough to hear one of the strangest things, singing sand. The truth is scientists have yet to fully understand why this phenomenon occurs. One theory claims that the sand might produce this sound while sliding down the dunes because of the friction between its grains. But how can you recognize whether what you hear is singing sand? Well, it's similar to an airplane flying in the distance. One of the few places on Earth where sand makes such a loud noise that it can actually be heard by tourists is in the Namib Desert in Africa, or in the barking sands of Hawaii. To see a rare golden waterfall, you'll have to drive to Yosemite National Park, more precisely, to the Horsetail Falls. You will need to plan your trip ahead of time to make sure you get there either in the winter or early spring. It's the only period of the year when this beautiful sight can be spotted. Let's be clear, it's not real gold falling down the mountain. Actually, it's an optical illusion. When at dusk, the sunlight hits the waterfall in such a unique way that it makes it look like a river of lava or gold. In a California national park called Death Valley, there are some rocks that seem to move on their own and leave trails behind. Scientists thought the roadrunner bird could be responsible for these movements, but this creature is too small to drag rocks around. They also thought it could be the wind, but the rocks are also too heavy to be blown away. Scientists have been studying the rocks for years. But until 2014, they hadn't actually seen the rocks move. They'd just seen them in different positions at different times. With the help of time-lapse photography, they discovered that the movement was caused by a combination of rainfall, rapid temperature changes, and a bit of wind. When it rains, the water sometimes freezes and the rocks get stuck in the ice. As the temperature rises, the ice starts to melt and moves slowly, dragging the rocks with it. The traces left behind solidify under the heat of the sun. The ice sheets that move the rocks is very thin and evaporates quickly which is why it was difficult for scientists to understand this phenomenon. Have you ever heard of a dirty thunderstorm? Buckle up, because I'm about to take you on a wild ride through the world of volcanic lightning. No, it's not a new dancing technique, although that would be pretty impressive. It's just a funky way of saying lightning and thunder during a volcanic eruption. When a regular thunderstorm happens, positive and negative particles collide and create a big spark of lightning. And the rumble you hear? That's just thunder. But when a volcano starts to holler, some ash particles get electrified and start colliding with each other. This causes electrical discharges, making it look like there's lightning coming straight from the volcano. And with all the ash, smoke, and gas flying around, it looks like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. That's why it's sometimes called a dirty thunderstorm too. Whoa, did you just see that giant ray of light shooting up into the sky? They're called light pillars. And don't worry, they're not a magic trick, just a bunch of ice crystals playing tricks on us. You see, when it's cold outside, these ice crystals floating near the ground reflect light from unshielded lights and create these columns of light that look like they're coming from outer space. 
But really, it's just a bunch of little crystals showing off their reflective skills. And if you think those natural light pillars are cool, wait till you see the artificial ones. They can be even taller because the light from streetlights is not the same. Ice crystals can reflect the light even if they're a little tilted. Just imagine, all that light is coming from streetlights just a few feet away. So next time you see a light pillar, don't run for cover, just enjoy the show. If you come across these quirky, bubble-like shapes in the sky, consider yourself lucky. These little gems are called mammatus clouds, and they're not your everyday run-of-the-mill clouds. Most clouds are formed when air rises, making them look like big cotton balls. But mammatus clouds are formed when air sinks, making them look like they're upside down. The air above and below such clouds creates a little turbulence, and before you know it, cloud particles form perfectly round orbs. Just don't stand there gawking at them for too long. They often signal that a thunderstorm is on its way. What do we have here? It looks like the sun is wearing a colorful party hat made of rainbows on top of the Ore Mountains in Germany. This phenomenon is called a sun halo, by the way. These snow-covered trees look like they're joining in on the fun too. It's all thanks to those ice crystals in high clouds. They love to bend and reflect light, making it look like the sun is having a halo lava lamp dance party. And yes, it might mean that bad weather is just around the corner, but don't let it spoil your fun. You can still hang around and take some great pictures.